in our first video on societies at the crossroads, we looked at the decline of the Ottoman Empire and the reasons behind that. Now we're going to look at attempts at reforms and the challenges that the Russian Empire faces uh, leading up to World War I. So when we revisit some of this information, we talk about the fact that Russia has been attempting to become more Western uh, since the early 1700s under Peter the Great when he kind of took that tour of Europe and he was like, wow, we are far behind in terms of manufacturing, in terms of urbanization, which we're still in its infancy in Western Europe, but also in terms of style, culture, and things of that nature. So much so that, you know, um, Peter the Great essentially said, hey, we have to dress like Europeans, we have to talk like Europeans, and we have to essentially carry ourselves like Europeans. So he establishes that new city of St. Petersburg. Um, it's kind of the window to the west along the Baltic Sea to expand themselves into more trade with the rest of Europe on the sea lanes. Um, you know, they have to wear European style clothes, they have to cut their beards and, you know, look and dress and act European. Um, and a part of that was also extended into the idea of how do we, you know, militarize and more westernize our military force uh, to be more an effective fighting force. And then also some reforms in how do we, you know, treat the vast majority of the population, which were the serfs, which again is similar to, you know, slavery that was existing in other parts of the world at this time, which is also where most of the economy was based on within agricultural uh, production. And there was mostly, you know, grains that they were, you know, essentially exporting to the rest of Europe. Um, and they had had some limited attempts at reform under Catherine the Great and following, you know, the death of Peter, um, kind of in the late and mid 1700s. But again, not a whole lot of change had actually happened. And there was a lot of uh, surf revolts and uh, kind of revolutions to try and again uh, fix the problems that were going on within uh, the treatment of the surfs. But again, to no real avail at this point. All right. So kind of going into and following the end of, um, you know, Napoleon in 1812 and 1815, Russia would continue to go to war and try to expand its territory um, and is very successful actually in expanding in every spot except against one group of people, and that is the rest of Europe. So they're able to, um, you know, expand into territories held by the Ottoman Empire under where the old Safavid and Mughal empires had been under independent nations in, you know, Central Europe, or not Central Europe, Central Asia, um, able to essentially keep a stranglehold on Poland in the eastern part of Europe, and then also expand into a little bit of China and even threaten Japan, which we will see unsuccessfully does not work out well for Russia. Um, but yeah, because they threaten that balance of power within Europe, because again, Europe believes that no one power should become too strong or too influential, um, and with Russia imposing itself on the Ottoman Empire, as we mentioned in the last video, the British and the French ally themselves with the Ottomans against the Russians. Um, and defeat them in the Crimean War. And so while the while the you know the British and the French have to essentially bring their forces all the way into the Black Sea, travel across the Mediterranean to do it um, to aid the Ottoman Empire, even though the Russian Empire is just right there. Um, the tactics, uh, the technology of the ships, and the guns that they have are vastly superior to the larger Russian numbers. That it spells disaster for the Russian military, and again emphasizes we need to westernize. All right, and they will continue to do so um, in order to kind of again increase their influence in Asia, but also within Eastern and Central Europe, um, again putting more and more pressure on the Ottoman Empire, helping to essentially free, in many cases, um, the Slavic people. So um, again, Bulgaria, Romania, um, Serbia. That's kind of why Serbia and Russia are connected. Um, you know, prior to World War One, um, and also try to increase their trade in the markets along the Black Sea and the Mediterranean again, at the expense of, you know, um, the Ottoman Empire and then other European groups as well. All right. So the first thing that they do in terms of how do they really try and westernize and modernize themselves in the mid 1800s, or again, this is about the 1850s, 1860s, is to end serfdom, finally. Okay. And again, this is right around the time when, sil when slavery in the United States is ending and is coming nearer to an end in Brazil and almost every Western country at this point in the world. Okay. But with that being said, we will only see a limited increase in terms of the peasants' and former serfs' rights. So this is done in 1861, again, as a result of trying to modernize, but also end serf revolts. So when they abolish serfdom, they give them full citizenship. They give them the right to marry without the consent, without needing the consent of the landowners or of the nobles, essentially. And they're allowed to own their own property. And however, they do owe labor obligations and work. Uh, to the nobility is kind of payment, so sort of a sort of a compensation, which slowly goes away. Um, but most of the land is owned in a, in a 
group known as the collective known as MERS, so um, or MIR. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, so I apologize if I'm saying it wrong. Which essentially is like collective ownership um, in the town or in the region, um, which restricts their ability to essentially sell the land and go move off in other directions because it's communal property. They can't just up and leave if they would like to or sell it to a neighbor. Um, and so there's not a whole lot of individual uh, ability to move up in the world. All right. Um, but yeah, few could own or sell their own land or improve their living conditions and economic status as a result of this. So even while there's a means and a little bit of a chance to do it, it's not really uh, explained or really fleshed out for them to do so. And then agricultural production does not increase because, again, they are still behind in terms of manufacturing agricultural tools compared with the rest of Europe um, and the United States. And so, again, they have a growing population due to the introduction of the potato. All right. Uh, thank you, Colombian Exchange. But they are, again, uh, very struggling to keep up with the demands needed for their population, although they are still very much, you know, the big wheat exporter for much of Europe. Okay. And the nobles, however, again, make off, even though they lose their workers, they actually end up keeping the best land and, you know, um, the serfs have to work for a time to pay off their obligation debts, which obviously, again, is still a negative in terms of how they were treated. So here we see um, kind of the losses again to the Ottoman Empire. Okay, um, so again, areas that were able to essentially become completely independent. So um, with autonomous governments, there's Serbia, Wallachia, which is part of Romania, Moldavia, uh, which will become Moldova, um, and then areas added by uh, Russia over time. Um, and then you can kind of see the areas that are added again in the 1800s. Um, this little part here along the Black Sea, um, this area of Kazakhstan, and you can kind of see, again, complete, continuing to spread across Central and um, Eastern or Eastern Asia. All right, you can even kind of see getting very, very close to Japan and China, or even expanding along those borders. Um, so yeah, so with these reforms essentially meant for the serfs to help produce industrialization and more manufacturing within Russia, um, we have to remember, most of it was limited prior to the 1850s and, again, was very much behind Europe or the rest of Europe going into, um, for the most part, World War I. There were some things they were really, really good at. And again, a lot of it was just exporting their own natural resources, which were, again, turned into other manufactured goods. So um, most of the manufacturing that does get investment ends up being in the western part of Russia at this point. So Moscow, St. Petersburg, Kiev, um, Warsaw. Um, you know, Minsk, I'm trying to think of other, Smolensk would be another one too, but essentially most of the manufacturing is done in the western part of the country that's closer to, or closest to Europe. Um, so this allows for a larger workforce to now as, you know, the serfs are now able to move to the cities and the majority in the cities are now newly migrated farmers. But again, just as we see within much of the industrial revolution, they are paid poorly, they are treated poorly, and there's a lot of resentment um, kind of established out of this, right? Um, and also the quality of the work, the quality of the factories, the stuff that they are producing is, again, not up to Western standards, which leads to, again, um, struggles for actually making wealth for Russia itself, all right? And so for the most part, what this is done for with the industrialization and the freeing of the serfs is not out of entrepreneurialship, as we see within, you know, Europe and North America, it's not done by private investment or for private investment and you know, just being prosperous. It's done to expand the power of the Russian military and the Russian government. Okay. Um, so that is a very good comparison to be considering here is how are the, or very good contrast for how these are different and why, because this is pushed forward by the government, not by individuals, which is the opposite of what we saw within the idea of the free markets of England and also the United States. Okay. But one of the things that Russia does well to increase its industrialization is to build the Trans-Siberian Railroad connecting to essentially St. Petersburg all the way to Vladivostok. Um, and I have no idea how many thousands of miles that is, but it expands across all of Russia and then, you know, other lanes and uh, built as well to increase settlement, to improve industry and resource extraction, and the also exporting of products to the rest of Europe. So coal, steel, oil down here in the Caucasus Mountains. Um, and helps with, you know, Russian expansionist policies in Asia, right? Um, which we, again, we will revisit uh, later points. So to, again, increase industrialization, 
Russian or the, the Russians do allow for European loans and investment into it while also trying to raise tariffs to protect their industries, which Russia does to a, a good extent, but most of it, again, about 50% is still owned by foreign industries or foreign individuals. Um, so a lot of the money is still not staying within Russia itself. All right. So they're increasing their exports and increasing their production values. And there is some increase in the actual profits, but again, a lot of it is still leaving the country because of the influence of those individuals due to capitalism outside of it. The workers, as we said, paid poor, or uh, paid poorly, um, long hours, mistreatment, which leads to a lot of considered illegal protests in unions at this point, um, and with a growing socialist discontent. So you can kind of see where this brews up to the Rev Russian Revolution in the nineteen in nineteen seventeen during World War One. All right. So there's growing urbanization and middle and business classes, but again. They're not as strong as the middle classes that exist in Europe at this point, or even in the United States. Um, as most of the vast majority of the population, similar to what we see within Central America and South America, is most are poor farmers and laborers who don't have a whole lot of say or political power. Okay. So in terms of the political changes, okay, Russia, for the most part, stays under this idea of an absolute monarchy, pretty much one of the last ones that remain in Europe up through just about World War I. Um, and any types of political and free speech are essentially repressed by the Russian government, all right? Again, in the 1860s, for more local autonomy, they do, them, they do allow more local forms of government to essentially, you know, control their own little towns and regions um, through elected local assemblies known as emsvots. Um, so they can elect their own representatives, control local affairs, but... Most of the seats in the power lie with the nobles, again, who own the most land, they're in charge of the military, the bureaucracy, they have most of the wealth. Um, so while it's an idea of a means to give more support to the working class, it doesn't actually lead to it because it's still dominated by the nobles and, you know, the aristocracy essentially still will exist up until the, you know, the, the Russian Revolution. Okay. Uh, the courts and laws become more European in nature, following closer to Enlightenment ideals of how people should be treated under the law, um, and their attempts at spreading education and literacy, which will again have long-lasting effects. Some of those being uh, the movements to again reform and change water, Russia into a more modern state, politically and socially. Um, so you have a resistance movement within Russia known as the intelligentsia, which is led a lot by the college, the now educated college students. Um, as well as some other intellectual leaders um, to, again, expand more socialist ideas. And so this happens both in the rural and the urban areas because, you know, the, both the uh, actual laborers and the farmers are all facing issues that they have problems with and that they want the government to resolve, but the government is not doing it. Okay. Um, so they're working to gain better pay, better social rights, more political rights, more voting rights, less... Um, more, you know, individual private control of their own lives and land, um, as well as less power to the aristocracy and to the nobles. Um, but again, meeting a lot of different resistance. Um, so they want the right to unionize, they want the right to protest, and when that's denied, they will violently protest, and a lot of violence occurs uh, between these different groups of people and is, you know, often very, very much repressed or suppressed by the Russian government. Um, so one of the things that they say is we want these changes, but we also don't like Western materialism that we're building all this stuff for. We'd rather stay more Russian, which is where Vladimir Lenin is going to step in in the 19-teens. In the 19 teens. Okay. Um, we also get some groups that are not Russian because a lot of Russia, again, is very multinational, multi-ethnic. So you have Romanians, Ukrainians, um, other groups that want more independence. Now thinking about the idea of nationalism. So Russia also puts down the idea of Russification, which is a Russian-style education system pushing Russian language, Russian values um, on those people inside of Eastern and Central Europe um, who are under Russia's control. And there's also increased, you know, uh, disenchantment with people who are not considered Russian, so pogroms and the forcing out of Jews out of their territories. So all this kind of results uh, comes to a head when Russia loses this war against Japan in 1905 um, with all these, this starting off a bunch of protests and movements to reduce the power of the Tsar they create their first legislature known as the Duma, but it's essentially just kind of something that's in existence that doesn't have any real authority. And again, this sets the stage because you have all this stuff simmering under the, under the surface with attempts at reform unsuccessfully leading up to World War I and the Russian Revolution 
shortly thereafter.